Welcome to the Free Money Podcast. This is the show where we explore what's keeping the world from investing in progress, answer the questions on the minds of people in the know, and give you the Brooklyn Bay Area consensus about institutional investing that you desperately crave. Uh, on the former part of that, I'm Sloan Ortel. And on the latter part of that, I'm Ash B. Monk, and we're going we're gonna to unravel the world of the pensions and the sovereign funds today. Um, and I love that intro, Sloan. I feel like maybe we should each have an intro. Music. Oh, oh, little, oh, are we know, jealous? Like, are we getting sound effects? A little envy? bit. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> what I what I had in my mind was like, you know, when the the baseball players at the minor leagues. That's Ooh. where I go watch the sporting events. Yeah. Uh, they all walk up to the plate with like awesome music. <laughs> Get them pumped up. Uh, wait, so what, hypothetically, what would your walk on music be? You know, oh, what, what would be? I'm totally putting you on the spot. Um, money, 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 money. <laughs> it's like money. Have, like, yeah. How many, how many money themed uh, songs I think that's the OJs. Be? Yeah, seriously. I think that is the OJs. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But uh, how did you celebrate Black Friday this year? Did you, uh, did you get anything new for the home, for the missus? Oh, man. Should I plug a product? Um. I got this crazy uh, air freshener. It's like an air air cleaner. Because, you know, here huh. in the California, we got <laughs> these uh, forest fires now. That's how yeah. the climate is changing for us. We, <laughs> we got all these, like, clean cars on the road to, like, make the air clean. And then Mother Earth was like, boom, forest like- fires to <laughs> F with you. You thought you were going to have clean air. Um, but there's this brand new, uh, this thing called the molecule with a K. Oh and, God. That sounds like it comes from Silicon Valley. Oh sure. dude. It's Does it have actually, an app? I think actually the science comes from like university of North Carolina or something like that. I'm totally wrong, but the okay. tech, okay. the tech comes from somewhere else other than Silicon Valley. And then so the imported. kids, Ooh. the kids of the professor turned it into some, uh, fancy air air filter that like pulls everything bad out of the air. Wow! And it, if you've lived in the Bay Area, we're drinking <laughs> the Bay Area Brooklyn Jazzy Jazz, as you know. Uh, if you lived in the Bay Area in the last two years, you would have been desperate for a good air filter a couple of times. It's just been yeah. it's been real bad. And so with two little kids in the house, that was what I did on Black Friday. How about you? That's um, I finally ponied up and got a Roomba. Um, and, uh, I got a, I have a, apparently, a, a, I have an amazing head to head story. Cause I, I got like the base model Roomba that sends you stats on oh the number God. of, um, of like dirt events that it yeah. logs, right? Like whenever it sees dirt, that's a dirt event. Um, this is amazing. And, Do you know what I bought today for my wife? I know she doesn't listen to the podcast, so it doesn't even matter. Yes. Um, She's going to be so mad because I bought her a Roomba. <laughs> and it's like the first sin of presents to oh, buy man. somebody. <laughs> well, at least you didn't get her a Peloton. Like. <laughs> I know. But in it's addition like, to the Roomba, I'm going to get her a little something to make her feel good. But mm-hmm. come on. Isn't the Roomba about like freeing your time so you don't got to do anything? That's how I resolve it. I mean, yeah. like it, it's, it's honestly the greatest thing ever. Um, but... Um, I got the same model as my friend Josh and we'd used it about the same like six, nine hours. And in that time, his logged 38 dirt events and mine logged 1,128 dirt events. What? (laughs) Sloan, you need to, you need some, no, you know what you need? A Roomba. That's what you what need. I need. What I need is Jesus. You I, need like, a Roomba. That's it. No judgment. You got the Roomba. Roomba You're going to be clean. Roomba Jesus. <laughs> Roomba Jesus. Yeah, and like, well. <laughs> it's different than well, baby I, Jesus. It's the Roomba. I, I mean, so it's either we have very talented cats or an overachieving Roomba, um, you know, so. Indeed. Gosh, we um, should do an entire episode on just products we enjoy. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, well, that'll probably help the uh, the sponsorship offers that we've gotten so far are mostly very seedy, so maybe uh. that'll improve the quality of our inbound mail. Um, yeah. But you know, but I think what a lot of uh, fund managers got for Black Friday was fired, right? Oh, By, uh, yes, they by, did. <laughs> um, it was Calpers, right? Yep. Dyslexia yep. strikes again. I can never. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say. <laughs> yeah. No, it is Calpers. It's not Cal Furs or Cal, Cal Smurfs or Cal Starp. I don't know what it is. It's Calpers. 
<laughs> but yeah, so they, they cut the number of fund managers that they're using, uh, I think from 17 to five or to three or something like that. Um, and I heard it reported as like, you know, man, this really makes you think twice about that whole ESG thing. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the, the thought being that emerging manager programs like these smaller mandates can often nurture investment talent that doesn't look like, you know, the standard cis white male uh, kind of paradigm and sort of usher more diverse decision making into, um, you know, the, the, the whole industry. What, what's your take on this whole thing? Yeah, if you hear deep breaths, it's because I'm inhaling for the rant that's about to occur. <laughs> Look, um, I, I'll start by saying I don't, I don't know the, like all the specifics. And, and in general, I actually am a fan of shrinking the number of managers and forcing LPs to be much more thoughtful about who they select as GPs and not simply try to diversify away all this risk by saying, look, we'll just have more managers. That's like mm. a recipe for paying too much and and not getting better so, line so of interest like and all the, these the, things. So, that's so the in big general, funds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going and saying, look, we want to have seven managers instead of 70, even if you're a major holder of those seven managers, you can negotiate better co-investment rights. You can negotiate better fees. You can get greater alignment of interest. So, so usually I think like fewer is better because with a concentrated portfolio, you can, you can do more, you can do more with your partners and they actually become partners. But yeah. let me stop that train of thought before it gets out of hand, because that's not what we're talking about here. I don't think, I think what the topic we're talking about is like, should we be like, you know, cheering on the erosion of, or the kind of um, shrinking of these emerging manager programs? And I yeah. can't, I can't do that. I, I'm, I mean, I think these programs are like one of the very few places inside pension funds and sovereign funds um, that like truly take innovation as a key component where we're picking people and strategies that haven't been proven time and time again. The idea is to bring different, you know, types of managers. Oftentimes they're people of color or women or veterans, but doesn't need to be. The emerging manager programs just oftentimes mean uh, managers that are, you know, of a certain size or below don't have, um, you know, in the private markets, they're second or first fund managers all yeah. these different things, right? It can be anything. And so I'm bummed. Like the, the, the constant theme on this podcast has been, we need tons more innovation in yep. the pension fund world. We don't need less, you know? But and so, 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 the, idea, so yeah. the idea is like, maybe it's less complicated, but it's also less innovative. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, the, the way that I would describe it is like, um, there's this tension between efficiency and innovation. You can't do both. Yeah. And, and so the, the saying like, Hey, let, let's shut down the innovation engine. Cause none of these places have like R and D teams. They don't exist. You yeah. Know, the emerging manager program was like one of those few areas inside pension funds that felt a little bit like an R and D team where you could kind of incubate new ideas and new people. And, and we're, we're shutting down the R and D and we're just moving into like the standard path, you know? And, and let's so, see if we can be fast and efficient on that path, but let's do the standard path. So I'm putting on my CIO hat, mm. um, and uh, this is a physical hat. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> there it is. Um, oh, yeah. yeah it, it's blue. Uh, uh, it's, and, you know, I would say, like, so if I'm in this position of, like, defending this move, I might say to you, like, um, well, you know, not so fast, right? Like, we, we were paying these managers in aggregate. Um, like let's say, I mean, I think what, what CalPERS did was cut from 30 billion in assets under management externally to five. Mm. Right. Um, and okay, so, so that, that's part of the public equity reconciling. Yeah. I, for some reason, I feel like there's a difference between what they do with public markets and what they've done with emerging managers, but I might be getting confused. There are a lot of sleeves here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's like a multi, but like, you know, I, I might say like, look, you know, there's an internal versus external innovation thing where, you know, with all the budget that, um, I was sort of, you know, not calling a fee, just calling a cost, mm. uh, you know, or not calling like a budget line item before, um, I can actually now hire, cultivate, you know, uh, young talent in, in, inside. And, you know, maybe there's not so much of a hit to the diversity component. 
um, and the innovation component of things. Is that like I'm cool with that? Th- <laughs> does it, does it, does it, <laughs> look, you know, look, I want innovation. Yeah. And so if that innovation is like demonstrating how a big public pension plan can cultivate internal talent and not have it run out the door the minute somebody's willing to compensate more, then like, let's try that innovation. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not just like, Hey, we need emerging manager programs for the simple reason we need emerging manager programs. I'm saying we need innovation. Like the the world needs pension funds to change how they invest because we got all these mega problems that aren't going to get capital from anywhere else. But like, if if you think about like the rate of change, right? Mm. You know, so there's the, there's the external locus, uh, center of innovation where you're like, you know, we're getting all of these folks in, you know, from, uh, you know, these nimble little funds and we're going to put them and task them to all sorts of interesting things versus the internal engine of innovation. Um, like what are some of the material differences between, you know, those two pools of talent, um, that are irreconcilable, right? Is, is there a degree to which like there's, you know, I mean, I guess every external manager will tell you that you can't do, uh, what they do internally. Um, Mm. you know, of course they say that. (laughs) Yes. I I wish, you know, you could never do what I do. I've literally had a manager say that they could never do what we do. Yeah. This was like a, lo- a like literally. I won't tell you the manager because I don't want to talk to that person. Um, <laughs> and if you know, Lord knows they hear it and they're like, "I'm going to talk to that Ashby guy about it." I just don't want to talk to I, them because you know, I I actually believe that in the case of those dudes who just like sit around and read the 10Ks and Qs and vote their proxies and that's it. Um, yeah. You know, like those value dudes who like hang out in the middle of nowhere and just like are yeah. real real nerds about 13 stocks. Like I kind of buy it, but I like that. You know, yeah, those- you know. <laughs> But most of the time, these pension funds, they're the ones that could take a long-term view. Yeah. Like there's this fascinating, um, there's a fascinating thing. I, I think it's Adam Grant who um, writes all these like books about talent and human resources. And he went out and he studied um, SEAL Team 6. And okay. he was like, look, this is the most elite military force on the planet, you know how do they recruit the people who end up becoming the single most elite operators? Hmm. And what he found was there's like a, it's a two by two and uh, you know, going vertical axis is, um, uh, skills on the battlefield. Would I trust you with my life? He said, and on the horizontal axis is, um, skills in life. Would I trust you with my wife? He says, (laughs) uh, And, and what SEAL Team 6 says they will never, ever cave on is like having the max scores on Trust You With My Life. And they're willing to put up with people that may not have the maximum scores in terms of battlefield, huh? according to Adam Grant. And so that tells me that having a mission-driven, trustworthy person that is in a culture of excellence and who will be completely trustworthy is more important to the highest performing teams on earth than the military God who, you know, knows how to put a bullet between somebody's whatever at a thousand yards. And, yeah. and when I heard this, I was like, this should, this should be like the, the sort of song for pension funds this next summer. You know, it's like, we have the culture, we have the mission. We can recruit the people who are trustworthy. The people who go work for a pension do it, not just to enrich themselves, but to like master the kind of future of a pension or a community or a university. And yeah. and so, I don't know, I feel like when, I literally like my brain turned to that comment you just made when I, when I watched this th- thing on the YouTubes which was like, God, that guy back in New York who runs this asset manager who said they could never do what we do. Yeah, they wouldn't actually because they're better. They can be better. It's not yeah. just about their pocket. It's about the, the higher purpose. Anyway, you got me ranting. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they're higher. Pur- but, you know, at like the New York in me has got to suggest that the, uh, you know, the, the whole incentive fee structure um, outside of a pension fund is ultimately destined to be better than uh, have you re- actually outside have you of seen outside it? of an american pension plan where we're willing to pay cios ninety thousand dollars but we'll pay football yeah. coaches three million in other yeah, parts exactly. of the world we recognize that we should pay the pension fund people more you know yeah canada but australia europe here in the u.s though it's very 
<laughs> it is indeed. It is indeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> exactly. The womp womp there is warranted. The womp womp era. I, I the uh, I mean, are we in yeah. the womp womp era? That's the main. Yeah, I think this is the womp womp era. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, I mean, I guess with the <laughs> oh, what are the symptoms of the womp womp era? Like uh, <laughs> a recognition you know, that like things are just going completely wrong and not being able to do anything about it. Yeah, exactly. And like the, the womp womp just anxiety. carries on. We look at the yeah. womp womp and you're like, this is obviously wrong, but it just keeps happening. Yeah. Shout out to Brexit. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, uh, I, I look forward to, you know, how the, the provincial island culture of the UK will evolve over the next, you know, 25 years of, uh, of weird isolation. Uh, mm. mm-hmm. But... Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> That's enough of that. It's time for Dear Ashby. Oh, um, my favorite. The, yeah. What I is mean, this again? You know, <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, this is a segment where you answer questions that people wrote me. Um, and okay. the first is like uh, a, a, something like we've seen on Twitter has come up a lot in the acidona mm. world. Um, you know, so I, and the best way I can phrase it is uh, why are so, quote unquote long run short sellers Mm. Uh, we're worried about um, GPIF, uh, the Government Pension Investment Fund of Japan, uh, moving to re- restrict stock lending on oh, right. the $1.6 trillion worth of uh, shares that they own. Right. It's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of entrenched interests here. I mean, people are giving Hero crap, and but I, you know, I think he, it's an incredibly um, bold and frankly exciting endeavor like you know they're not gonna they're not gonna be lending their their stock out to short sellers in order to um gosh there's a few reasons that they listed but one is like look we want to be able to engage with ceos of companies and if we lend our stock out like we don't have the voting rights um and and i think there's a there's a bunch of other reasons that they're doing it um I think what he's taking flack on is he kind of made a, a judgment call that like the short selling market is unethical. And, yeah. and so, you know, people are building a little straw man here and saying, Oh, you don't understand it. But, but I actually think he does understand it. And maybe he's being a bit provocative about the short term, short market. Yeah. Um, but like well, for, just qu- a, a yeah, quick hit- jargon bust, uh, here, like the, you know, when you, when you own a stock in the normal way and you hope to profit from it going up, right. That's going long a stock. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Where you, if you want to do the other thing and bet against it, um, you typically will borrow a stock from uh, some broker and sell the stuff in the open market, and then hope that later you can buy it and uh, and and return it to your to whoever you borrowed it from at a lower price, right? So you profit from that spread. Yeah. Um, you know, and like the you know inherently, right. You can all, you can go unlimited on the way up and only, you know, a hundred percent on the way down. So just right. in, in, for those of, uh, for those three of our listeners out of nine mm. who, uh, mm. are not, you know, kind of running hedge funds from their, uh, from their homes. It's a, I mean, uh, thank you for yeah doing that because it, it <laughs> is, uh, sometimes it, you forget a little bit how crazy it is, right. That these people who have made a long-term bet on a company, like if yeah. you just go back to first principles and, and our three listeners who didn't know about short selling, they probably are still like, wait, what? Because it actually sounds crazy. Somebody who has made a long-term bet on a company is willing to rent their shares to somebody who thinks that company sucks and wants to sell it. What? Well, but they, they generate a higher yield for that, right? Like, well, they, they actually- okay. They get paid for, for the loan, right? That's, yeah. what, you know, the stock loan market. You get paid for loaning out yep. your stock. Um, but like the, the number, this is one of those things that's like, that I say frequently on the show, um, is individually rational and, and collectively crazy because you can get paid, but there's so many other things that go on here. Like by creating this stock loan market and making it so cheap to short companies and do the activist investor thing, um, you are, you are kind of... (laughs) pushing the companies that you want to be public and um, kind of dynamic to stay private. And so you might Got make it. 80 million bucks if you're GPIF 
from mm. your loan, your stock loan sales. But I promise you the consequence of making these shorts so dominant in public markets is that the companies stay private and GPIF ends up having to spend eight billion on private managers in order to get the same exposure they might have gotten 20 years ago. Gotcha. Because by allowing these things to be lent out, they deteriorate the quality of the public market. Yeah. Um, that's and make the it a collectively more hostile crazy. place to hang out. It's hostile. Yeah. You got all these short, I mean, every, you know, like, you know, taking Tesla what? private, funding secured. Um, <laughs> you know, that was a... Uh, that well, that was, was, that, he, Elon Musk is pretty long Tesla. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. But, but like he did, he, you know, I think his big problem was he was mad at the shorts and he wanted to crush them. And so he committed, yep. you know, fraud. Securities yeah. fraud. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, you know, like just securities fraud to own the shorts. Who, you know, who among us hasn't done a little of that? Right. So rather than uh, committing securities fraud, what Hero is saying is like, hey, let's make the cost of being a short just a little bit higher. And I have to say, I'm cool with that. Like, I think shorting is great. It's a cool thing, but like, we don't need to make it super cheap for you to short our stocks. And, you know, we can make it a little bit more costly. And the long term investors can understand there's value that you can add to a company by communicating with your shares that you're holding what you think they should be doing. You don't have to go and immediately look for every single short term profit. Yeah. You can take a longer term view. And like, I G Hero and GPIF is all about long termism. That's what I, you know. I, I feel like part of this rancor is it because the business of being a long short fund is just starting to not suck. Like, uh -oh. I mean, for the because, right, I, I mean, when you when you uh borrow the stock and when you sell the stock out in the open market, you invest the proceeds in bonds, right? Yeah, and so as yields have been going up since the great financial crisis from zero to you know whatever they are now, three percent. Um, you know, you, that you, you suddenly have a, the beginnings of a business model there if the stock mm -hmm. goes nowhere, um, right? If it just stays in place. But, um, you know, like a marginal shift in the uh, the cost of the borrow, you know, uh, it just kind of puts you right back to the, the place where you can't get any more, any uh, yield on your collateral. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I, I feel like, you know, when I hear people going, wow, you know, uh, we are the longest term people they are. What I'm really thinking is they're going, we were so close <laughs> <laughs> to being back in business, you jerk. <laughs> How know. dare you start this now? We're just out of the doldrums. <laughs> yeah. And like, if you're an exchange that profits off the, like the volume it's through your exchange, you're like more shorts. Let's do more shorts. Yeah. Like every, it seems like yeah. everybody in like the fee machine of wall street loves the, this kind of business. Because it's about short-term profit. It's not about like, how do we create sustainable businesses and like send incentives to management teams of companies to think long-term? No, this yep. is the opposite of that. This is how do we extract as much wealth as fast as we possibly can? It's, it's for, you know, anyway, I don't want to say this. The one good right quote, I, so I don't want to like become too much of, I, I mean, I am a hero uh, tanky, like, you know, I, yeah. I think we should, but you we can, should probably we can push back on it. Hit me with the. Oh, no. Well, I don't want to like be too much of a hero tanky. So I'll, I'll come up with uh, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the the best quote that I've been able to come up with on kind of the anti side of this. Right, right. Let's hear it. Um, is uh, it's from Carson Block, uh, who's the founder of Muddy Waters Research is a, sh a short selling research firm based in Hong Kong. Um, he goes like, look, what we do is the most engaged form of ESG that there is. Hmm. Uh, right. The argument being like, look, uh, <laughs> you know, they, how do they make the most money by finding a fraud, calling it out and forcing the stock out of the market? Um, you know, the, you know, so there's sort of a, a, you know, a concept of like a negative activism inside of that, um, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, that. I think that he would equate, certainly others would equate to uh, the sort of positive, more generalized activism that is more common in the ESG community. I, I actually like that. I don't disagree. And I, I think when I, my comment earlier was like, I don't mind making it more costly for shorts. I think what I'm saying is like, I don't like that most of the institutional investors just see this as what they do. They just lend their stock out. You know? uh, oh, like, gotcha. Yeah. Be, be more thoughtful about it. Like maybe you think you can add value. So that the short sellers are saying, look, we're going to add value by highlighting the frauds. But like yep. they're just one of the actors that can add value to companies. 
There are many, yeah. val- like you can either add value by pointing out the baloney or you can add value by helping these management teams do the right thing and avoid the baloney. <laughs> That's a great. So like there's kind of an, by leaving that unexamined, you can kind of punt the policing of bad actions to the shorts, right? Yeah. You can sort of, you, if, if this was bad, they'd come and take care of it. Yeah. And that's, um, that is, I don't want that. Like, I don't think that's a sustainable form of capitalism where like the short term hedge funds are the cops that stop all the, you know, the pension funds or sorry, the management teams from doing stuff. We can be more constructive. You know, it doesn't have to be about all the negative stuff. It can be about pension funds coming in and being like, how's your audit committee? Like, where is your compensation committee? Like, yeah. we, don't, we don't agree with the people that are sitting on it. Like, these are all really constructive things that can be done to avoid the bad stuff. And that yep. doesn't happen unless, you know, your investors engage and say, this is what we want. And you don't get to engage if you aren't holding the shares. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's sort of like, uh, I mean, I, I do also need to dunk on the concept of long run short sellers, which is like a mechanically... I mean, that's, it's, it's like such a insane concept. <laughs> I mean, so just, just to, um, just to underline this for the listener, short selling is a business that incurs co- mu- like minute to minute costs <laughs> yeah, exactly. in the practice of it. Uh, so yeah. to, to have a long run short position is to go bankrupt. Yeah. Which is why short sellers are so desperate for volatility. They like launch infomercials to try to destroy companies. Right. Like, which, which is an art form unto itself. Which like, literally it. happens. That is, not, a, that is that. not hyperbole. They do infomercials to destroy, destroy companies. So, how, how long has it been since Bill Ackman did a 700 page PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm uh, old enough to remember when that was a thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm cool with the amount of time that's taken place. I'm I'm happy to have that time continue to accumulate. <laughs> all right. Uh next question. Um all right, so uh this is 100% true. It is legal to do absolutely anything that you want to an opossum in North Carolina from December 29th to January 2nd. Now, I know you you recently uh you know oh. got some research from North Carolina. Uh what are you planning to do in those 5 days when you <laughs> I saw Have the, you booked tickets you yet? <laughs> When you sent me this one, I was like, what is this, the new Purge film? <laughs> you know, like they're so desperate now for the next Purge that it's like Purge, possums in North Carolina. Oh, man. It's yeah. nuts. It's um, just like, look, we'll look the other way for five days. Yeah, do it. Yeah. String what them up. What the heck is this one? This I, at first I thought it was fake news. <laughs> um, and uh, but it's not. This is this one is legit. And. I guess the answer to that is, um, you know, it's over New Year's. Maybe we have a New Year's party with a bunch of possums. Uh, but I have to say, I Googled uh, I've Googled it, and the San Diego Zoo told me that these animals are often misunderstood and that they actually keep the environment healthy and tidy by eating dead stuff. And this was my favorite one. They um, eat the stuff that has ticks on it. And so they help remove ticks from the population. And as somebody who has had a tick and was ready to hurl, um, as you remove it, I like that idea. So why are we like, you know, I hope that we're not all killing possums in those five days. I hope we're like just dressing them up and, you know, (laughs) inviting them over to dinner. I don't quite know what else you would do in those five days other than kill them. I assume (laughs) that's what they're doing in North Carolina. Well, yeah. I mean, like, what what is it that you would want to do with a possum but can't because of all this burdensome regulation, you know? Uh, Seriously. We need a uh, five-day like, free-for-all. Yeah. Eat I mean, like, I have to I just imagine got, it's uh, eat them, right? Or kill just yeah. as many as you want. There's, but, well, I mean, here, there's a, 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 a clip that I, I played a little bit for you earlier of that I'm just going to preview for the listener here. Cricket is me and a possum box. We're both crazy and fun and just eccentric and off the wall. She's also got that super special side of her. And barley, too. I mean, that was my son. So, you know, you could always just adopt one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, m- um, make them part of the family. Like, there's great yeah. footage of her snuggling with her possum on I mean, I guess that. if you get the legal work done in those five days, it's done, right? <laughs> like, they can't take it away from you on January 3rd. That's a great point. Your so, grandfather, Dan. Yeah, you know, 29th happens. You're like, let's do this. 
Let's adopt a pasta. <laughs> well, actually, you know, you know, the another concept though is create a, a fashion brand around it, right? Because like the, I mean, the the fastest growing fashion brand in my circles is um is actually called Fashion Brand Company. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, and they make a uh, human sized clothes for lizards. Um, so the, the or lizard clothes in human sizes is their idea. Um, human <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, I'm trying to picture it. I'm picturing just, like sequent dresses and skin oh, they're, tight. They're amazing ups. things. Like okay. I, I have a I have a polo shirt from them that has three polo shirts, kind of. So it's got like uh, it's it's got like bare shoulders, mm. um, and the bare shoulders are the polo shirts. Oh, um, that's awesome. It, it's extraordinarily cute. Um, but you know, it's there seems to Another be an placement. opening in the. Yeah, I mean, like, bring the possum version of that. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, to bear. All right. So, well, okay. Like, I mean, let's go to a, a less, uh, you know, happy topic here. Okay. Uh, like, what's a, I mean, I already used the womp womp one. Um, I, th- mm, mm, well, mm. Let's, tears, let's, crying, I'll weeping. Intru- I'll introduce it with this. Uh, That's about right. <laughs> It's about right. uh, clown. This the, is the clown car emerging. Yeah, the, this is the clown car emerging. Yeah, uh, uh, Alicia Meccolini, uh, uh, institutional investor who is a friend of the Sloan and a friend of the show. Yeah, um, it did a great story on this uh, survey finding, which had uh, asset allocators are apparently. Oh, bat, you know, I, I think the the survey said nine percent of survey response respondents said they would still consider investing with a fund manager who has had issues with sexual harassment. This is an increase from 4% last year. Yeah. You know, what the actual frig. Hmm. My first thought was, let me get that alpha. (laughs) You got any alpha? That's what she wrote in the story. (laughs) Hey, man, man. Hey, man. (laughs) Oh, I need that alpha. (laughs) And, you know, Uh, and they're like slapping, make their, that, slapping their wrist that, hard as they're like trying to find that alpha. And you know, I'm making a that. Oh, I need that alpha. That's your ringtone from now on. <laughs> need that alpha. <laughs> need that alpha, dude. I don't care what you did. Um, you know, when you need the alpha hit, you deal with some shady folks. And uh, look, in all seriousness, I think this like there's an unhealthy pursuit of alpha in the pension fund world, like. What percentage of pension funds have the attainment of alpha, not just this, you know, search for, but the attainment of alpha baked into their uh, expected return target? Like almost all of them, you know, it's like yeah. they all, everybody is at Lake, Lake Wobegon here. They're all going to get alpha. And so they go out to the hedge funds like, let me get that alpha, need that alpha. And they're like, oh, I got it for you. And they're like, if I don't get it, we can't fill the potholes. The schools get, you know, lose their money. You know, the public services get cut. Because guess what? If we don't get the alpha, we got to put more cash money into our pension funds. Because yeah. that's how it works. And so the alpha is truly a drug for these government officials, these policymakers that are like, give me that alpha. And this uh this story to me just feels like a natural consequence of like the tight budgets the yep. the challenging environment we live in where there are like so many other things that governments want to spend money on other than the pension funds yeah. to teachers yeah, well, it, that it, retired I mean, it reminds me of kind of like ago. Yeah, I mean that's old news, you know. I mean, who needs to help a, a, a teacher who's like, you know, not even like <laughs> Yeah, they're not really even working. part of the economy. These teachers, yeah, stupid teachers. Actually, um, I lo- I lo- please pay teachers more. That's my please, message. Please, please, my mom was a public school teacher. My grandmother's a public school teacher. My, my wife please, is on the board of the public school. <laughs> you know, you we, we love teach. But fine. The point is, when the when the darn uh, you know discount rate was set, we baked alpha into this world, and so now all the yep. pension funds are like, let me get that alpha. And if you're delivering alpha, I don't give a crap that you buy machine guns that kill children or that you commit, you know, acts of depredation with people you shouldn't. Um, we just need the alpha. 
It's insane. I mean, it's like, you, I, it, and I, this is actually much more widespread than that 9% says. Because yeah, I talk to people I, all the time. I thought it was time. surprising. I talk to people all the time that are like, yeah, oh, our foundation, we support resolving <laughs> climate change. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So you guys don't invest in uh, fossil fuels? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, we well, we well, totally well, invest well. in fossil fuels because we got to make money. Yeah. It's all and in the near term, I mean, it, but it's it's such a weird, I mean, it's the classic, you know, if you tried to explain it to somebody on the street, they would think that you were start, start raving mad. I mean, like, it, it's almost like trying to explain yeah. McKinsey to someone who doesn't work in business, right? They're like, what? <laughs> that exists? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> poor McKinsey. Uh, uh, no, but <laughs> they like, really <laughs> effed up with that ice thing. The Pete Buttigieg, <laughs> that's okay, but the ice thing, man. Yeah, uh, I mean, just let me get on my homosexual, um, like uh, whatever it is, hobby horse for a second. Do it. I, like, I'm a little, yeah. Let me get on my big gay horse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but like, I, you know, I'm I'm a little. I think he's under gay. You know, I mean, like uh, Elizabeth Warren, a heterosexual woman, feels gayer to me than Pete Buttigieg. Uh, mm. Yeah, well, you know, she's also and, like welcoming in, you know, trans community on the website, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. We were talking about that yeah. in the last episode, right? The it's fab, I mean, like the super trans uh, inclusive stuff. But I mean, to, the thing about Buttigieg to me is he's just sort of like this very, um, it's almost like if you were to sort of do a McKinsey survey of what an acceptable queer candidate to Republicans would look like, you would get Pete Buttigieg, yeah. who married the first man he dated, which is like, I, literally, I, I can't even think of a queer person who's had that experience. Is that what he did? Uh, I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure he, I'm pretty sure he met Chaskin on Hinge and uh, and then they got married. And because hmm. he, he was, to be clear, to be fair, he was already the mayor of South Bend oh, when he came out, mm. you know, which is like, and it, like, I have a lot of sympathy for that. I've been at a place where people noticed when I came out and it sucked. So, mm. you know, <laughs> like I get that you might not want to, <laughs> um, you know, but it's a, it's a little surprise. I don't know. Anyway. What were we talking He's, about? Uh, se sexual assault, which to yes. be clear, Pete Buttigieg is not accused no, of. I was going to say, I thought we were <laughs> He's doing great. <laughs> totally good dude. Uh, well, well, he may not have my vote at the primary. Yeah, it sounds like you might have lost one vote there, Mayor Pete. But. I, it, yeah, it's a, a front, but no, like I, I, I think though, I mean, it's, it's interesting that there seems to be this tacit assumption that, um, misogyny is an alpha generator mm. uh you know or at least uh exterminating it comes at a cost that uh, or at a cost to alpha mm. um in the subcontinent you know in, in in both of our heads too because I, I think we were both surprised that you know only nine percent of all allocators would uh still consider investing <laughs> yeah uh you know i mean like i would have put that number at one in three based on you know personal I mean, the, experience the reason it's so low is because the the question was sexual harassment. Okay. So yep. if you went to a bunch of union pension plans and you said, would you invest in private equity firms whose job it was to like break uh, unions and move to regions <laughs> that had, you know, right to work or whatever it is, the, the laws, yep. you know, and, and like my guess is half of them would say, yeah, we'll do that if the returns are high enough. And they oh, would, man. you know, they'd point to fiduciary duty and they would say, but we have to, you know, and that's what the, that's what the foundations do. And that's what the endowments say, you know, they invest in all these things that are literally counter to the organization yep. that sponsors the funds and they justify it all in a fiduciary test and to turn it full circle Sloan, this is why I'm so depressed about the erosion of the emerging manager programs, because that was an, a, a little area where pension funds would be given, in theory, a bit of a free pass to take a shorter term, lower return with the idea yep. that you could build longer term, sustainable and high performing investments. And if we lose that, then then we are stuck in this world where, you know, foundations trying to solve climate change need to invest in coal. And that is baloney. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, I realize as we've been talking about this, that, you know, there it's natural to assume that investment management as a whole is this dynamic, innovative, uh, you know, f force, right? But 
in truth, the industry is consolidating. Mm. Um, you know, and like, I mean, if you, I, 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 like I have in conversation found myself re- uh, referring to f- firms that have like between 10 and a hundred billion dollars under management as the impoverished middle. Right. Yeah. Right. Which gives you it, you know, cause like they, they have enough scale to be kind of relevant, not, but not enough scale to be super, super relevant. Right. I mean, like, so that gives you a sense of how, how high the hurdle is to actually get established in this business. Um, and yeah. so, you, you know, like well, three, three billion in a, in a kind of equity public market frame is like not enough. You haven't gotten there. Yeah. You know, yeah, hundred exactly. billion. You're like, Oh, we might break out. We might make it into the big leagues. Yeah. And it's like, it, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's terrifying. If you think about that, I, I mean, we, we've yet again managed to head towards a conclusion without planning at all that wraps up the whole, the whole show, uh, for which long distance high five. Indeed, uh, indeed. Um, no, but like, but seriously, I, I think that underscores more than anything why, uh, this is such a kind of big and scary step for mm. these funds to be taking. Cause it, um, it makes it harder for, um, hippies like, you and I to mm. show up at places and make, you know, evidence laden cases about why the industry is changing. Um, yeah. Like you know? if you and I showed up with like some fabulous fund idea the the path to actually doing it is so <laughs> steep. Like, could you imagine if you and I actually were like, instead of doing a podcast, let's do yep. yeah, we're turn a our podcast into a hedge fund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we were like laid out the path. Like, we would be obligated to go recruit some. The, the truth is, you and I would be obligated to go recruit some white dude out of a hedge yeah. fund that has a track record. That person would then end up getting a huge portion of our economics, and we would co opt their legitimacy in order to have any chance of building something in this industry. There's yep. really no and, other way. And, and to, to be clear, we, you and I have a fair number of industry contacts. Yeah, uh, but, but, we like, know a few pension you know, funds. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, but like seriously, like that. I, I, I think you know. Imagine if you're like somebody. I mean, um, I forget her uh, last name, um, but I think her first name is Harlan. There's someone who who um, built like was sleeping in a car to build a um, a uh, a VC fund in. Uh, I think I think it's first round. That's no, not first round. Mm. Anyway, um, you see uh, it more. I think you see it more in the venture space where a lot of what you're being underwritten for is a network and, yeah. and it's like softer, you know, it, it's like you're buying, you're backing people early. Do you have a great network? Can you get access to great deal flow? That feels a bit more human. Whereas when yeah. you're doing like a public equity thing, people are just like, well, what's your track record? What's your tracking error? What's your sharp ratio? And you're like, I don't have any of those things. You know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I have an idea. I have a back test. Yeah. Um, a back the, test. Exactly. They'll be like, go the, talk that, to a family it, office. The person then. I was thinking of was Arlen Hamilton at Backstage Capital. Mm. Um, the, but yeah, like it's uh, the, you know, if you're, if you're going to do this like $5 billion, you know, or you're going to try and become a legitimate large cap equity manager, mm. I mean, my hat's off. Good luck to you. That's Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would sooner search for the Northwest Passage. Yeah. Yeah. Or the like Yeti. Just get, get into a ship and try and find a, a <laughs> find a way route through. to the Indies. <laughs> um, There's got to be something other than Panama. How do we get over yeah. there? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like you know, I, I think too often these uh, you know searches for innovation stop at the keyboard's edge. Mm. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's important to to really you know challenge these ground truths. Um, exactly. But anyway, I think that's a. It, do you have any uh, any more trenchant thoughts to share with the <laughs> listeners before we uh, wrap it up for this week? Have a, a great holiday season and uh, happy New Year. And and it is insane to say this, but like it's almost 2020 and, and oh it, no shit yeah oh god like uh, <laughs> 40 years ago was the 80s yeah you know it's funny i like i've been doing the unthinkable and thinking about um buying a car recently because i've been skiing oh, a yeah. bunch and whatever um but in that process i realized that 2002 was 18 years ago you're like oh 2002 uh, that's a pretty new car and you're like yeah, whoa like, wait a second yeah <laughs> They're like, well, it looks new. It's all the, I mean, yeah, I, you're like, I oh, can't I'll just believe. go drive it an Uber. And they're like, actually, that's way too ancient for us to let you to drive it around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like when you don't like pass the Uber test, given, the, given some of the cars you've gone in an Uber, 
You're like, this, yep. this is ghetto. Yeah, There's a bunch like, of cars whoa, that don't make the Uber wait. test. <laughs> I, uh, I, well, all right. I mean, gosh, it means that we, we may as well see, we may see you in the next, uh, next decade. Yeah. Decade. That's what, that's where we go. 10 years is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. See you in the next um, decade. See you in the next decade. Bye. Bye.